This is Mike Cothran talking to you from beautiful downtown Humble, Texas, where it's extremely wet this week. Uh, Beto, I mean, uh, Beta was uh, uh, full of water. Anyway, I've talked to uh, Miranda and encouraged her not to do a survey on how many of you are in jammies this morning, but I can tell you from my part, I won't be uh, standing up with the camera on. I, in, in front of you today, we have uh, the three different segments of, of what we're gonna go over today. We'll walk around the forms, which is an introduction to a uh, post-tension uh, form building, uh, deficiencies th that frankly occur in pre-owned and new foundations and reporting uh, uh, in the trick method or manner. And uh, that's actually for the benefit, not only of you, but of your client. And uh, maybe more importantly, your client. We have a hundred slides to go through this morning, 120. The good news is 20 of them uh, are uh, text like this and uh, we will be uh, moving rather swiftly this morning. So let's go ahead and dive into it. We're gonna walk around there. We're gonna learn what, the, what it is to, uh, to do the forms. Let me see if I can click through. There we go, okay. Your basics are uh, that most post-tension slabs are a hybrid. They're actually a combination of post-tension um, cables and rebar, the, uh, and some mesh sometimes as well. So, uh, or steel mesh. The uh, in installation and, and inspection start with plans. And uh, then in order to uh, uh, use plans, you got to be able to read them. And then concrete is uh, not poured, it is placed, as you'll see as we go through. And then time is of the essence, once the makeup is done, to uh, put the concrete in it because the forms begin to deteriorate immediately. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is this is the basis of your client's investment. So this is a big deal. These uh, inspecting these things don't take it lightly or as an ancillary way to make money. This is, this is uh, you know, it's, it, everything uh, sits on the uh, foundation. So it's the basis of the investment. And so it's, it's, it's important for you to take, uh, take your job seriously here. Okay, there you can see that it's a hybrid. We have both cables and we have rebar in this particular picture. And every time you see the two of them together, they need to be tied together. So we have two rebars in at least three locations in the picture that are not wire tied. Everything works as a unit and, and moves as a, uh, as a single function. And this is why we need plans. Best laid plans of mice and men, and you can see that this is a, a made up picture, but it pretty much de demonstrates why we have to have some plans in order to guide us as inspectors. And on this picture, you can see at the bottom right, those plans need to be engineered, and that's a decree of the IRC. And they need to be signed by that particular engineer, and he needs to be licensed in the state of Texas in, the, in all of our cases. The plans also should have the uh, builder's name, the address, be address specific, and then the plan names. And so when you see plans, when you're fortunate enough to get plans, um, you, uh, you should note that. This is the final page of the plans that you'll be dealing with when you're inspecting a, um, or installing a, a post-tension foundation and it's called a beam detail in the jargon of the industry. And it, it cuts, uh, gives a cross section of each and every one of the, uh, of the uh, uh, beams, which we'll talk about later, uh, and how they're built, what kind of cables or rebar they have in them, uh, rebar cages, whatever the case may be. We talked about placing and not pouring. And honestly, in, in the 80s, when I did a good portion of my superintending and, and uh, builder uh, time, uh, we didn't ever use pump trucks because they were too uh, expensive. Now it's extremely commonplace. And uh, not only the mix that comes from the concrete truck, get the left of the picture, 
but then runs through the truck's pumping system and down to the uh, to the makeup area where it's going to be placed is all uh, uh, controlled in terms of the amount of water that goes into it. Okay, this uh, I'm going to take just a brief minute and 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 talk about something that and I don't have a good picture of it because there's it's not possible to, to make one. I don't think I thought I put one on here, but anyway. Sometimes you'll go into a garage of a finished home and at the car stop on all three sides of, of the garage sunken area, there'll be a crack. And the reason that that happens is because when they place the concrete, particularly on a hot day, and they don't have complete control of the concrete, they will do the, the uh, finished floor level of the foundation and hold the truck and hold the pouring or the placement of the concrete into the uh, the step down area of the garage. When they do that, and too much time has elapsed, that becomes a coal joint and an instant crack when any kind of movement goes along. So just watch for that on your finish tones, and that would be the reason why you've got the cracking there. Then you know. Okay, there's some of those areas right there, and I think. Hopefully you can see my, my cursor that's going along right there. And it is, uh, this is a porch and this is the garage. And uh, let's see, I think I've got another one. Yeah, there's the porch. On this particular porch, you can see a tall piece of metal standing up here and some little bitty metal standing right there. Those are the attaching devices uh, that uh, connect the foundation to the frame. Okay, in every, uh, in every uh, foundation, you have a set of plans that you wanna go by. If you get called out on a pre-placement inspection and there are no plans, or you find that there were no plans used, the, the makeup uh, installer uh, did it by the seat of his pants, I suggest to you, and I have walked away because that, that means that you're the one that's approving the installation and the structural integrity of that, and we are just not capable of that as inspectors. Okay, once the foundation has, uh, you know what, this, this picture, see those uh, little wires that go back and forth? Those are all welded together. That's that mesh that I was talking about a little earlier. Once the makeup is, is finished, Time is really of the essence to get concrete in it because rain and even a, 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 a gravity can start begin the deterioration process of the uh, of the makeup. Okay, I wanted to uh, let you know that uh, I'm assuming that many of you have come on to to uh, get a kind of a primer on uh, what it goes on uh, in terms of your being able or competent to uh, do a, a pre-placement inspection. It's not something that you can learn in two hours. The certification process by PTI, the Post-Tension Institute, is three days. Um, and uh, fortunately, Tapria has in, uh, and Internachi has in the past given two or three uh, weekend sessions with a test included that you should have taken advantage of, I hope you did, that makes you a little more certified to do it. And even then, you really need a mentor. You need somebody who knows what they're doing that you can go out with uh, just to see how and what you're supposed to look for. Because even in any class that you've taken, you know as, uh, as well as I that you can't get all of the the uh, I's dotted and T's crossed in those classes, you're going to find some stuff that's just weird. And so uh, plan to do some apprenticing. And one final note is even when you do this inspection, just as when you do a Trek inspection, you are not an intermediary for your client between them and the builder. So don't get caught in the middle of it. So many inspectors call me and they're trying to dig their way out of it. What do I tell this builder to make him do it? Well, you have no power over this, the builder to make him do anything. Where your real power is, is to serve your client and tell them 
what the condition of the uh, of the makeup is and why it should not have concrete introduced into it because it's it's going to affect the integrity of the uh, of the foundation okay let's go through the materials and the installation of a post tension foundation those are the items we're fixing to go through and in this picture you see the boards uh, creating a, a footprint for what will eventually end up as the foundation. Those are the forms. Tendons, also called cables. They come in a variety of colors. They're beautiful. <laughs> they come in everything from black, red, blue, green, yellow, red, blue. I said that, didn't I? Anyway, those are your tendons. That's what it looks like in the inside. They're half inch, seven strand, twined, twisted cables. At the end of the cable, and we'll, we'll wrap up or pull all this together, are anchors. And they go with the end of the cables or the tendons to help anchor them on both ends, surprisingly enough. Wedges. And I put live end wedges, but there are actually wedges at both ends of the cable. And there you see it in action. See, it goes at the end of the uh, of the anchor, and there it is seated in the anchor. And we'll allude to this in a little while. Now, on one end of the cable, you see you have cables sticking out, and you have a black thing right here. And that uh, uh, black thing is called a pocket former and it goes in and you've got the anchor sitting right next to it and that is the end that gets tensioned and there's the the uh, dead end and on that one you see we have the anchor and the cable you see we have taping right here so that it won't rupture the concrete when the tension is put on it and then what we can't see on this end is the anchors are sitting, or excuse me, the, the wedges are sitting inside the anchor right here. Notice there's about an inch space between the two where the installer has not allowed for that inch coverage of concrete. That's when on a pre-owned home, you see the little uh, dark spots of, of about a half inch, the rusted areas where the cable is poking through. Not a good thing and not supposed to be that way. There's a, another good uh, uh, picture of it. Now notice on this side, we have a, a 16 penny nail that attaches it to the form. And on this side, we have no nail. Not a good thing, because when that um, uh, tension is put on that, this end is gonna wanna pull this way. Not good, not good at all. That would be a deficiency. Hmm. Two pictures of that. Oh, dead end anchors. Notice right here, anytime we have two cables or rebar and cables or mesh and cables put together, we put a wire tie on it again so that we <clears throat> this thing moves as a unit. That's a chair. We'll go back and look at some more of these as we get a little farther along. And that's the cat head. And the, the end of the cable that sticks out has a cat head on it that needs to be right up against the form right here. So when they, when they, when the concrete is placed, it will pull up that loose part of the cable into the form and bow the cable. We want the cables nice and straight all the way back to front right there. And that cat head prevents it from pulling in and doing this kind of number when the concrete pushes against it. Concrete is amazingly heavy material. Notice the uh, black poly we have on there and anything not transparent will be fine. I saw one the other day, I don't think I put it in here, but it was, <laughs> it was actually a combination of red, white, and blue uh, moisture barrier. Now the moisture barrier actually serves two functions. Uh, it's it's uh, noted uh, function is to prevent ground moisture from saturating up through the porous concrete. 
when you look at a concrete, uh, or excuse me, at a garage floor that has like a white powder on it, that's called efflorescence, and that's the moisture coming up through the concrete. It dilutes the, or, or, or uh, dissolves the lime in the concrete, moves it to the top of the concrete. As the uh, moisture dries, it leaves the lime there, and the, the lime is the white powder that you're looking at. Okay, let's go on to installation. Uh, just a note, if, as, if you haven't figured it out, I'm kind of cross-referencing into uh, pre-owned uh, homes as to what you might be seeing as you, uh, as you might expect them. Okay, we're going to go straight to beams. Now these deep holes, these trenches right here, these are called beams. And they are the load-bearing members of your foundation. Your foundation is all one pour of concrete replacement of concrete but it is um, it is it has members that do different things what you will find if you overlay the floor plans on top of this is that most of your walls will fall over a beam so they become the load-bearing walls now this one if you go out and are inspecting a pre-placement I uh, should uh, draw a little question from you in terms of this cable doing an abrupt change in, in position and going this way. It looks like it maybe should have been straightened out. So I'd consult the plans and find out what the heck's going on here because th that would mean that the engineer drawing this probably didn't have his glasses on or maybe needed to see his optometrist because that ain't looking good. Now, when I consulted, the uh, plans, I found out that the, the installer had not done this right. It should have been straight. Pull the tension on the cables. They will try to make the cable straight and they do weird things like rupture and blow out uh, your, uh, your concrete. Oh, I did put it in. Okay, I forgot the white part. Well. Should have done this on Memorial Day, shouldn't we? This is uh, a float for a sunken area that happens to be the patio. There's a step down always or almost always in a patio and, and this is how they form it. All right, let's move on to other things. And uh, you know, sometimes we have gas, electric and water and drains running through the foundation uh, or underneath the foundation. This is a, an electric conduit running to an island from an outside wall. It's not crooked, it's not advised, and it's certainly not without engineers' uh, guidance, not something that we just jack up and put in if we forget to put in. If we forget to put it in, it's a mortal sin. Drainage trenches, trenches, we'll get back to the drains in a minute. Drainage trenches, trenches are critical to help the uh, uh, makeup drain. As I said earlier, water begins the deterioration process, erosion process of the forms. Okay, let's move on to inspecting it. That's what we do. You certainly don't want water in your beams. Edward Robinson asked me to go out and take a look at this about maybe five years ago. And it was an, oh my gosh, what do we got going here? We can't, <laughs> you don't put concrete in at one end and just flush the water out the other end. That's not, that's not what we're doing. Water de deteriorates the strength of the concrete through the solution. And it was bad. It was real bad. Somebody could have drowned in these beams. Water also creates cave-ins into the beams. And you should know that beams are, have a prescribed width and depth by the engineer. And that's something that you also will be uh, uh, measuring on an inspection such as this. If you have cave-in, it's gotta be cleaned out. Can't do it. What you can't see really good is this one has caved in and pushed the plastic out 
So it has a bulge at the bottom of the beam and in, as well as this, in, this uh, beam wall having caved in. Okay, let's talk about uh, drain lines. You can cross a beam with a drain line, but you can't run this way on a beam, through a beam, because the, uh, there's too much pressure on the, on, the, on the drain line, and these are only made out of PVC, and it, uh, it can crack it. Also, uh, recently, uh, uh, the IRC has required that we have sleeves on this, so you would have a larger sized PVC pipe over the top of this, because so this could more easily move if the concrete moves. The sleeve would go from one end of the concrete to the other end of the concrete in the beam. <clears throat> we talked about width and depth already. Notice the cable, uh, how wavy it is along here. This one is actually not too bad, but I believe we will see uh, if, uh, see some that are worse as we go along. Roots, no tree roots allowed. No tree roots allowed. In the fill that goes on top or coming through the exterior underneath the foreboard. Also notice that this cable is resting right on the plastic. Later on, we will see that these cables uh, need to be resting right in the middle of the four inches of concrete on top where there is no beam on top of the plateaus. You will count the table, uh, the cables, tendons going this way and going this way. And even if you don't have plans on one of these, which not very often, but occasionally I, I will not uh, con a, uh, a builder to uh, 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 let me use well, at least while I'm out there because they think it's proprietary, which it isn't. Um, I will let the, uh, or I will report the number of cables so that any, if anything ever happens, <clears throat> my client is armed with the information to go back and the builder needs to justify why he maybe had not enough cables uh, placed. Okay, all the cables need to be tight, nice and tight, okay? No wandering cables up and down here. Cat heads on the end of the cables play a big part in that because they need to be tight, not away from the foreboard. They're almost like a clamp. As you're out there looking around, just take a look around the, the, the makeup and see if you got any extra cables laying around out there. That might be an indicator that they don't have them all installed. It also might be an indicator that they got too many. So you gotta get just as, as everything else we do, it's a reporting process. Okay, this is one of those uh, beam detail cross sections that I talked about earlier. And here you can see that the cable is right in the middle of the concrete. Okay, and that's important. Let me move Miranda out of the way here. Yeah. They don't have any chairs showing on this, unfortunately, but chairs should be within six inches of the edge of the beam right there, and every four feet in between. Notice we have a tendon here showing and a tendon here showing. And then notice that the cable, as it gets to, whoops, as it gets to the beam, goes down. It goes down so that it makes really good contact and is maybe six inches below or so the top of the concrete. If it if we come came to right here and we put the tension on, the chances are way greater. Um, for it to blow out the concrete right there and we lose the cable tension and, and have a mess on our hands. Also, you should know that there is a, uh, one of the things you'll learn in the Post-Tension Institute class 
it's, it, it's that there is a, a spray that goes 45 degrees on either side of the tendon. And this is where all the pressure is placed on this when the tensioning happens, right in this area right here. All right, uh, tendons, you see here that they're tied to the rebar, but the rebar is lay laying right on the plastic. Not a good thing. Tub buckets. How many times on a finished home have we looked in behind when we're, when we're uh, thankful or good enough to, to have a, a tub access to look in there and we see dirt? Well, we shouldn't see dirt. Here you can see that the tub bucket should be raised to allow four inches of concrete underneath and the moisture barrier. And right there, what they're missing is uh, tar right up against the drain coming through the plastic. That's a big deal. And that's why we see all that dirt. Great entry point for termites. Great entry point for termites. There's another shot of it. We went through chairs wire tied, always chairs wire tied, cables wire tied, tied, chairs every four feet with six inches, within six inches of beam. We talked about that. Well, I did put the red, white, and blue one in, didn't I? Okay. <laughs> Where the cables pass under those floats that we talked about earlier for garages and patios and porches and so forth. Um, we should have a chair that's upside down that holds it from floating up and being something that we might see when the concrete is finished. We want it again in the middle of the concrete. So sometimes chairs are not down, sometimes they're up, as in when they go um, under floats. They also on, are on their side when we come up against a plumbing riser. And that one doesn't have one, obviously. And the reason for that is, again, when we tension the concrete, it tries to pull the cable straight and it'll crack that riser. Drain lines with a crack are not always good from a sewer gas standpoint. There is a well board running through a beam, but no sleeve on it. That's a pretty heavily laden chair right there. You can see that some of the rebar is laying on the plastic, but none of it is tied. Big deal to have everybody tied together. Okay, let's get back to, whew, I got some of these slides out of deal, out of uh, sync here. Let's take a look at that. That one's uh, coming up. Oh, there you can see the chair on the side, but it's not tied, wire tied. So that would be a big deal. That's known as a pigtail. It's a water line coming up from the outside underground to the interior wall. It prevents uh, freeze, freezing damage, unlike when you have water just coming up on the outside of a, of a house. It's a good, it's not required, but it's a good, uh, good uh, installation idea. Okay, now think about when we got that pump truck and we've got overhead concrete and the, the, the end of it, the tail is kind of flopping around and it comes over an open drain line and fills up full of concrete. Don't know if you've ever had an experience like this or one of your clients has, but it's not any fun. Jackhammering foundation, so forth and so on. We do need to cap them to prevent that from happening. And frankly, duct tape over it is fine. It's adequate, but we need it capped. That's kind of what it looks like underneath the foundation, or underneath the concrete, once the concrete is installed. You can see on the ceiling there that uh, the mesh that they had in there is all rusted now. 
So it was not laying in the center of the concrete, it was on the floor laying against the plastic or where the plastic used to be. That is a, uh, an island where we have several things stubbed up. Uh, one is uh, um, a uh, <laughs> electric conduit coming up and it's the wrong kind of conduit. Here we have two drain lines and they're coming up. I'm sorry, that's a water line, okay. And this is a water line as well. Obviously we have a hot and a cold. We have two drain lines here, notice, and that would be the, that would be appropriate. One drain line coming up to serve a sink uh, and the dishwasher not adequate. To properly do it according to code, you need two drain lines. One of them goes to the vent and the other goes to the main sewer line. And that's a, that's a, a detail for another, another class, but that is the case. Now what they're missing here is in the electric. So that would, you would note on the report. There is the electric conduit coming in. I don't know who edited this thing, but it's like firing. Okay, I have a question here. Let's see, I can only see part of it. Mike, you, can you address the vapor barrier requirement in the standard of practice to omit plastic in the bottom of beams? Let me move it over here. I call it out immediately. Okay, all right, good question. All right, we had uh, the vapor barrier and then it goes down into the beam. Now, let's uh, go to the uh, outside beam, the exterior beam. Uh, it should go down the dirt and into the beam across over to the uh, to the outside and the the outside dirt that would be just to orient you underneath the foreboard should not be covered. Uh, city engineers and city uh, inspectors uh, sometimes call for different things. But the difference really is uh, has to do with the supplemental grounding and um, uh, uh, the ability for the, uh, the foundation to release moisture into the soils. And that's, that's the difference and that's why it's that way. Okay, now we talked a little bit about the metal uh, things that were sticking up on a finished, uh, on a concrete placement, tying the frame to the foundation. This is a method called anchor bolts right here. And these are installed directly after the placement while the concrete is still uh, wet. So are those other metal straps that we saw. One is a, a, a frame strap and the other is a mud sill anchor that we saw in a previous picture. Okay, after the placement, seven to day, 10 days uh, later, it should be tensioned. Um, so let's go right to that. This is uh, a uh, tensioning, <laughs> tensioning press. And uh, it, uh, let's see, let me move my chat box out of the way. You can see it uh, on, a, on, a, on a table it, 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 with a, um, an anchor. Uh, installed at the front end. Here he's he's tensioning the bottom cable. In this particular uh, foundation, we had a cable up on top and a cable up on the bottom. And uh, he's tensioning the bottom one. He puts 29,000 kips on it. Kips is a pressure uh, rating and it's roughly equivalent to the same amount of PSI. I think PSI comes in a little bit uh, less, uh, but it's a lot of pressure nonetheless. And uh, since we have these going across the foundation and then going back to front, what we end up with is a grid of um, tensioned cables that are all pushing toward the center and uh, provide the structural integrity for the foundation. Until this is done, this is not a structural entity. It is a slab of concrete sitting on soils that as we know around here at least, move like a banshee. It's a, it's a, a nightmare. 
once uh, the inspector has come back and confirmed that the tensioning has taken place, then they come back with a concrete saw and they cut off the cable and the little, the little nails that hold the anchor in, they're sticking out there. You can't see them real good, but they're sticking out there. And then they grout over them with non-grout. Now, when we see those in pre-owned uh, homes, uh, many times they will have been deteriorated. It's because they didn't use the right, right kind of grout. They probably just slapped some bricklayer's mortar on it, which is way too sandy and wrong kind of cement. Okay, now since the uh, slab of concrete before tensioning uh, is not a structural entity, Grading and drainage, just like we have heard forever, uh, is a huge deal. And it needs to be established almost before the concrete is placed, but certainly directly after the concrete is placed, so that water doesn't pool right at the foundation and have the ability to lift and lower foundations just in, in a particular areas where the grading is bad. Huge. Uh, one other thing I wanted to call your attention to that is See how the, the adjacent yard with the finished home is, whoo, my battery is running low. We're gonna take a break in here in just a second and, the, and um, let me see what's going on with my power. Um, anyway, uh, that all of the adjacent yards, uh, green, uh, drainage is going on to this one right now. That's not a good thing. Here's your, typical drainage patterns that you've seen forever. And I know that this only is class A drainage where everything's to the front. There's also one of these for class B and class C drainage that uh, takes different routings. The point that I want to call to your attention is right at the foundation, the grade moves away from the foundation so we don't have any ponding at the foundation. That's what, that is the major cause of foundation movement at least in elastic soils. This I just came across. Um, it is uh, a potential vertical rise. It's a map that was uh, put together by, hold on just a second, Geotech. And I'm, I'm, oh, David Eastwood. And I want you to look at how much the soils can move from season to season, wet to, to uh, dry season there in uh, areas around uh, Houston. It was actually kind of amazing to me, but not a huge surprise. If you, uh, those of you who are familiar with Houston, if you notice out here in the Dayton area and then over near Crosby where Newport is, look at how much that moves, five to six inches. That's a bunch of movement. And then uh, in the southwest part of town, Look at all the movement that's over there and over near Hobby, where Sagemont is. These are all areas that are known for foundation issues. Um, but pretty interesting on this one. It's it's just something it's something that he's just put out, and I think it's exclusive to David. So, thank you, David. All right, let's take a minute. Let's see where are we at on time? Let's take a minute and, and take some questions, Miranda, if, if you want to do that. Yeah, so we just had um, one question on the Q&A. Um, which PTI certification do you recommend for residential home inspectors wanting to get into more pre-pour inspecting? No problem. Level one. Okay, and then we had another, what is the minimum? exposed tendon length needed for tensioning? Um, about four inches. Uh, what they do, <laughs> that's really short. I know I, I've seen them do it even with short. They have something called a donut. They, they attach to whatever's sticking out and they attach a longer tail onto that so they can grip it with the tensioning device. Okay, I think those are the only questions so far. Oh, um, actually someone just asked you to please cover again the details on when plumbing can cross a beam. Say it again. Um, 
cover the details on when plumbing can cross a beam. Plumbing, oh, okay, all right, good. It can cross, cross a beam anywhere. <clears throat> it just can't run in the beam. And it should have a sleeve over it, so you have the actual drain line covered with a, um, a sleeve very similar to the sleeve that, go, that we should be seeing underneath the meter on the riser that goes up to the meter so that it can slip, one can slip and slide inside the other. Perfect. It looks like those are the only questions so far. Wow, we got an intelligent group and I'm just going, I'm just reviewing with them. How good is that? Okay. Um, we're going to look at deficiencies and anomalies in both uh, pre-owned and new homes that we might see. I think most of us are doing doing uh, new home inspections uh, for, for the at, at the finish stage. I uh, want to caution you not to get your yourself in a bind uh, by putting yourself out there as being able to do pre-placement inspections, which is what we're going over today, and framing inspections. Now, my qualifications, uh, my personal qualifications. Uh, for that, our um, IRC certification as a as a combination residential, and in in fact, it's actually not with I, our ICC. I'm a legacy from CABO, if any of you know what that means. And then the other one is a PTI, Post Tension Institute Level One Inspector certifications. Surprisingly enough, though, I will tell you that probably my best credential is 15 years as a home builder of post tension and foundation homes and on the job exposure, um, learning and, and growing and, and seeing all kind of uh, deficiencies and, and weird stuff happen um, and things that are out of place. So that's why early on I put on to this that you really need to pair up with somebody who knows what they're doing and uh, do a little apprenticeship on it. Uh, I know in the day, these days of fast track um, uh, licensing with Trek, <clears throat> that um, appraisal or apprenticing has, uh, it is relatively unknown. But if you think about the, the great professions of the world, most notably the Masons, it has always been uh, that uh, they didn't vary from the apprenticeship uh, learning process. And so actually um, uh, on the ground training, on the job training, uh, I think is my biggest, my biggest uh, certification. Okay. Uh, those are the things we're fixing to go through and we're, uh, I think, running, running really, really good on time here. So I guess I better slow down. Otherwise, we're going to be finished too early, and I certainly wouldn't want anybody to uh, go to sleep. All right, how about the next slide? Go. There we go. Okay, pre-owned and new homes deficiencies and anomalies cracks. Okay. Um, as you're reporting, and I'm probably going to get into this a little bit before the slides uh, have come to that topic, but, but when you have cracking in a foundation, it means that there's movement. It also can mean that there is, uh, the installation was not good. It can mean that the concrete was not good. It can mean it was way hot that day. But one thing for sure, if you have a crack, the surface cracking stuff, don't cut it with me. I, I, I've never seen cracks that didn't make it all the way through certainly the four inch area uh, of the uh, of the foundation surface. I'm noted <laughs> and have had several real estate agents call me and say, hey, I found your your card in a crack. It was still in there. And uh, so that I, I, I use as a pictorial and I put it on my report to show that we do have some gapping. Sometimes we see the cables showing through. We talked about that um, earlier on in, a, in an earlier slide, and that's not a good thing. It's not something to crucify a foundation. Sometimes we'll see that the inch of concrete coverage 
uh, was not allowed for by the builder and concrete is a porous material. And when um, water seeps through and works on the steel that is the end of the cable there, it'll rust it and rust as we know when it forms, it expands the steel and literally pops out the concrete. We call that spalling sometimes. Not only has it spalled, but the, uh, the grounding material was not what it should have been. Okay, there is the end of a cable before the cable has been cut. You can see the wedge on the inside there, and nice and, and placed very nicely. Looks pretty even there, so we don't have any off kilter wedges. There's one, however, that has no wedges in it. That one is not stressed. That's also something that when you come back to verify stressing, you would go, hey, we got no stressing on this particular cable right here, or these few cables right here. And so this is not yet fully stressed. That would be part of the reporting part of that inspection visit. Failed route pockets we see a lot. Rarely do we see that the cable is still sticking through them, however, though. So we know that this thing probably needs to be checked and, and make sure it's got wedges up in there. So get on your hands and knees, get your flashlight out, look down in there and see what we got. Oops. Well, that one was certainly misaligned, wasn't it? There's another one coming out on the right. Sorry, we can't see the one being in the back. It was probably the juiciest one. Oh, let me go back just a second. No particular particular uh, picture on this one, but the, the, the topic is uh, spacing on grout pockets. So when you're looking at a finished uh, foundation, whether brand new and grouted, the cables are cut and grouted, or a, a pre-owned home, if you, uh, you, you should expect to see post tension cables about every five to six feet. If you don't see any, they may have reversed the cable and it may be sticking out the other side or they may have forgotten some. And at either rate, it should just kind of pique your attention and maybe uh, something that you want to note on the report. Okay. Moving ahead onto pre-owned homes, many times, although this this uh, hip right here is cut <laughs> cut badly, very badly, uh, and placed very badly, you do, can note that there's a, a little bit of space between it and this board right here, is, which I believe is the ridge board. Poor perspective on this one. Apologize, uh, and that happens when we have foundation movement. Very bad cut, very bad placement. Fire that framer. Okay, there's a corner chip, very close picture there. On this one, you can see that uh, the cables are, are sticking out, or excuse me, the rebar is sticking out down here. But this whole corner right here is chipped off. Uh, unfortunately, the picture taker, which was not me, but is somebody in the audience, should have swept the dirt off so we could get a real meaty picture of it. So here's a better one. Um, this is a, a crack that we see in the corner of a foundation. Typically, these are not a foundation uh, integrity issue. They are caused by thermal expansion uh, due to lack of, uh, of a, a thermal barrier between uh, the concrete and the brick on the corners. The brick layers, because of right angles, many times will forget to or not put one in there, unfortunately. So when the brick uh, and the mortar and the concrete go to, to swelling and shrinking with heating and cooling, the concrete loses. And uh, again, it's not a uh, generally an issue if the cable is not involved in the crack. You see, here's the end of a a cable grout pocket right here on the right side. And so this one would be uh, not an issue. And this one, whoop, sorry about that. 
That one's hiding from you. Who put this thing together? What a knucklehead. Okay, rebar showing. Rebar showing works just like the, the cable end we saw a little bit ago when the moisture, when it's too close to the edge of the concrete and the moisture seeps through the, the porous concrete, it'll rust it. And when it rusts, the, um, the steel expands and literally pops out the concrete. And it is a deficiency that we need to report. There's one that never even made coverage in concrete. It was right up against the form board. Piers. All right. We saw on David Eastwood's map of, of Houston, where we have a lot of shrink swelling going on, a lot of those ones that are fours, fives, and sixes. Uh, in the uh, in the inches that they shrink and swell, uh, the the cities or the smart builders or the engineers, in the case of unincorporated areas, are calling for piers underneath the slab on grade foundation that we're talking about today. And when you see those, you should see a bare pier top on top of it. Uh, it I'm going to into an explanation of peers. I'm sorry, I don't have a good picture of this. They don't come along too often. Uh, but we should not see, depending on the, on the engineer, most of them do not permit rebar sticking up on the end of the pier so that when you put the slab on grade concrete down, it would tie the two together. Some of them do, but most of them like the slab on grade to be able to float on top of it. Anyway, I, I bring this up so that if you were looking at, at one of these and you go, what are these things down on the bottom of my beams? It looks like concrete down there. Well, that's what it is, piers. Can you tell how deep they are? No. Can you tell if they're built right? No. Uh, you can't even tell if they're required by the engineer or have been inspected. Okay, there's some... Uh, when, when we have a house out of level, we, we do peering, and there's some peer holes uh, on an interior wall. Pretty substantial there, uh, peer holes, but many times you got to have some minion jump in there and crawl around and be able to put a jack up on top of a pier and uh, push the foundation back up into the wall. There's a cylinder pier on top of a, of a poured pier and a jet. Once they get the piers put in, the jacks will be used to push against the pier and against the foundation to push it back into level. And who's in charge of this? Okay. Blowouts. Okay. <laughs> There's a blowout. That's when the, the, the uh, tension on the cable released. And with 29,000 kips, it creates quite a, ha quite a bunch of havoc. You can see that the foundation cracked all the way up into here and over into here. It was, it was pretty rough. Now this was a little town home in Kingwood that I saw this weird looking lump underneath the carpet. And I'm hoping that this next picture does not come in behind this one. I would be disappointed because I want to show you. But being the nosy, excuse me, inquisitive professional inspector that I am, I go, okay, who's under there? Who they got buried? And that's what I found. This cable had blown out, come through the concrete, shredded the, um, the sheathing that covers the cable, and we we did the re necessary reporting on that one. Pretty interesting. Oh, apparently, we got some extra blowouts. Okay, this is a commercial uh, structure that I'm inspecting over in the Bel Air area, and you can see that they didn't even come close to using enough concrete around the cat head. It's not even covered. Cat heads need to be covered. They did a pretty good job of keeping it an inch away. 
uh, from the concrete, but they didn't cover it with concrete. So the the guy that placed the concrete is at, at fault here. There's another one. This thing was just fraught with them. I couldn't believe it. Excuse me. That last one that we just looked at was clo too close to the top. There's one where the <laughs> the anchor, which is normally parallel with the edge of the foundation, had moved around when they tried to stress it. Wasn't going to hold anything. So these are the guys that are coming out trying to fix it, and they're doing it with a a um, uh, concrete uh, chisel and trying to get down there so they can make a flat surface behind the anchor for it to anchor to. That's the fix. That's something that you don't want to see happen. See, this is guy has got river coming up that they're going to attach the superstructure to. He's not really excited about getting too close to them. So this is a real precarious repair right here. And there's another one where two cables come out too close together and not even close to enough concrete around here. Now you notice all of the rock showing through right here. This is called honeycombing. And the way we get around that when we're putting concrete down is we use a vibrator that gets pushed down in the suit and it literally vibrates the suit part of the concrete over to the edge. So we have a nice finished edge, kind of like right here, and kind of not like right here. Okay, grading and drainage is just huge. It is the number one cause of foundation issues in Texas. So on the reporting end of it, this deck is way too close and, and decks on grade as you know, they mess with the grading. In fact, some people have even seen dig it out so they can make the deck low enough. Not only does that make the deck susceptible to rot, but it also creates negative drainage where that area won't drain and puts it right up against the foundation to help cause foundation problems. It is a conducive condition to movement. Okay, this was a house that a trusted real estate agent called me one day it's up in uh, porter texas and she said would you come out and look at this i think we got a problem here and so when i drove up this house is at the at, in an area that has some healingness topography and it's at the bottom of the healingness so the water is going to run to this house and so they thought, well, we'll just come in and fill the yard so that it won't drain to the house. The problem is they trenched, in some cases, two or three feet uh, at the house. Uh, you can imagine that I didn't make note of that. There's our favorite uh, diagram that should be on almost every report. It is on almost every report that I see that has problems. Let's take a break, Miranda, and do questions if we've got any. Yes, we actually have quite a few. So let me start with, um, let's see. Someone asked, can any material be used in place of an actual chair for tables? An actual chair? chair. Yes. Sure. Nope. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. That is that is incorrect. I was thinking maybe a brick to hold them up on. That would be a no. But sometimes you will see rebar that uh, serves as a stake and is tied to the cables or rebar, and and that would be acceptable. Acceptable. <clears throat> okay. Um, is poly recommended under the ground rod? Uh, I may say this word wrong. Oofer in the grade beam. Here, let me send this question to you, um, Mike, via the chat. Say it, say it one more time. Yep. Is poly recommended under the ground rod oofer in the grade beam? U-F-E-R? Uh, uh, it, 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 uh, yes. Because 
as you know, it doesn't go down generally into the grate unless they've used it to try and stake it up. It connects to one of the cables. Okay. Is it required to have a certification to perform pre-pour inspections? Is it required? It's more like what you can get away with and are you competent and are you qualified and certified? That would be more of the questions. I would advise you if you don't know what you're doing to get the certification first, it's available online, but then behind that, you need to do the apprenticeship slash mentoring. Because you trust me when I, when I say you have not seen all the uh, situations that you can come across. Okay. And then this one is back on the vapor barrier question. Is there any allowance and guides to allow this departure from IRC other than engineer stamp? They have a prescriptive. Um, installation instruction in the uh, in the um, uh, IRC, but it applies primarily to what I'll call rocky terrain on expansive soils. They, they, um, they um, step aside for engineers. Perfect. And then... So it depends on your soils. Can and the... Oh, sorry. That's okay. In the Houston area, uh, I never see anything but engineers. Okay. Can the exposed uh, rebar be repaired using the cable grout? Um, depends on how exposed it is. The, the, the last picture where it was on the surface, there's no help for that. Uh, I would certainly clean the rust off and grout, but in any case, we got to clean the rust off and paint it with a, like a marine paint or a, or a rust-oleum or something like that prior to the grouting. Okay. Um, there's another question here. Um, plastic cable caps, as shown on the PTI design manual requirements, are important to mitigate corrosion of the cable end. They're asking if you have a photo of that. Maybe that's something that um, you can email to the class afterwards. Absolutely. It's, it's important. I don't think I included unless it's coming up. I don't think I included it, uh, one of them on it, but it's absolutely critical to keep in the cable ends, but it's not a substitute for having uh, coverage with concrete. In other words, backing them away from the edge by one inch. Uh, and it is, is no more or less than a, uh, a cap like you would find on uh, your, um, shoot, I don't know, <laughs> on your, I was gonna say, on. On, on your lady's hairspray uh, when she when she buys the pump sprayers, you know, it's a protective cap so you can't pump it. It's just a plastic, a little plastic uh, cap. It's generally clear. Okay. Well, then that will be it for questions right now. Okay. All right. Um, you know, we had the question on the UFER. Let's uh, let's dwell just a minute on that because there's, there's a huge discussion on it. Uh, since uh, 2011, uh, the uh, NEC has uh, asked for uh, supplemental grounding, uh, and it's primarily because the soils are resistant to accepting electrical anomalies of, of most any kind readily, and uh, it uh, is just a, a, another ground rod. Uh, it makes an allowance for um, the uh, Eufer rod to take that place uh, of one of the two. And uh, the, uh, the resistance that, that I have to accepting that is that generally they go down and they attach to a cable. They don't go into the ground. And if they went into the ground, I know darn good and well they didn't go eight foot like NEC requires. And then I look at the rebar that they're using for it, and it is not a, uh, an approved uh, material for a grounding rod. And if they go down and attach it to a cable, they only attach it to one of them. So the rest are two, maybe, if they have one handy. And the rest of the cables are, are, are not grounded, so it can't disperse it throughout the uh, concrete. And then finally, 
if we did have some kind of a tremendous uh, surge in electrical go into uh, uh, that uh, uh, euphor rod that connects to the post tension cables, uh, we, we talked about the heating up. Rusting is a very slow form of that, but uh, introduction of electrical force is, is another one going into the cables. They would expand fairly violently. And uh, what would that do uh, to a foundation? The concrete nation would rupture it. My opinion is yes, you'll have to follow your guidelines because everybody's all over the board on that, unfortunately. Um, Wayne uh, Rogers has uh, uh, landed on the side of they are not a second grounding rod. And according to NEC, they don't qualify. So that's where I come down on it as, as well, just from a common sense standpoint of the things that I just uh, enumerated. So anyway, we are whew, in the nine o'clock hour. So let's go on to uh, reporting. And reporting is uh, something that half of what we do is, <laughs> as an inspectors. And this, uh, we're gonna follow the Allotrek uh, reporting guidelines. This is not what you're required to follow if you're doing a post-tension uh, pre-placement inspection report because that doesn't fall under TREX purvey, purview. Uh, nonetheless, a lot of what we look at will be finished uh, homes or in, a, in a brand new homes or pre-owned homes. So we are required to render an opinion. I have inspection reports that are passed to me nearly weekly, as many of you probably have, uh, that have no opinion as to the performance of the foundation. And most of them have uh, uh, an allusion to sending folks to a structural engineer. And to me, at least, that is uh, uh, sidestepping your responsibility and your uh, as as a, uh, to establish an opinion on the performance of the foundation. And I tend to to uh, walk away from performing as intended. It's a real nebulous uh, way of putting it. And uh, Mr. Wilcox in the past has gotten with me and said, "Don't use that because it's nebulous. <laughs> you have no way of defending it." So I encourage you to not sidestep your responsibility. You are required to provide an opinion as to the performance of the foundation. And if it's holding up, it's holding up. And so what's the definition of performance of a foundation? Uh, performance of a foundation is adequately supporting the loading that's placed on it. It's that, literally that simple. So you need to make a, uh, an, an opinion that it's not or it is. And if you are saying that it is not, then you're, you're sending them or recommending the further evaluation by a structural engineer would be appropriate because that's the next step. You're a generalist and he's a specialist and that's what you do. Um, <clears throat> If you say that it's, and excuse me, notice that I didn't say a structural engineer or a leveling company. And I stopped, I used to, a long time ago, but I don't do that anymore. And the reason why is because I found over the years that leveling companies do a, usually a great job of leveling foundations and supporting them. They do, but they do a lousy job of correcting the causes as we'll get into in a, in, a, in a little while. An engineer should speak to all. He should speak to the causes, the resolution of those causes, and the resolution of the foundation movement or the fact that it doesn't need any right now. Now, the other opinion is that it's perform that you can provide is that it's a performing it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's job as a foundation. However, what we will find when we go out there is that there's a lot of conducive, if you will, conditions to it 
stopping or not performing against it. And that's a lot of things that it's working hard against. Grading and drainage is numero uno. Uh, lack of flow gutters or partial gutters. Uh, cable ends that are showing. Cracking that is uh, gapping or deflecting. We'll see a real good picture of one that's deflecting or one that's offsetting. And we'll see a good picture of that as we go along. Uh, and we'll go through a bunch of those. Are you paying attention? Yes, I'm paying attention. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> okay. Everybody, BS buttons. Um, so we'll get into that. Okay. Foundation appears to be performing its, its uh, intended function. No evidence of significant distress was observed as indicated below. That's what I, that's my phraseology. Or foundation appears not to be performing its intended function. Evidence of moving of movement was observed as indicated below. So in addition to rendering opinion, you're also supplying the rationale for you reaching that opinion. And that's that's right out of the track book. So you should be doing both of those. I received a report last week that didn't provide an opinion, and it almost had two sentences under the foundation section. I, I will tell you that with pictures, my foundation section ranged from two to two pages of my report to five sometimes. And it kind of depends on what I found when I get there, because I want these my client to have a pretty good idea of the condition of the foundation and where it may or may not go and what I think about it. I also know that that really needs to be the biggest section of your of your report. And, uh, you know, just to kind of give you some comparison, my reports range from 30 to 40 pages. I'm not a 100 page guy, I'm not even a 50 page guy. Uh, actually, I had a real long one about a month ago that was 45 pages. That, that I consider to be uh, uh, really long. But since the whole investment sits on this foundation, why would it not be what you pay the most attention to? It's also the most expensive. So kind of playing that into your reporting. Reporting is many times as big a deal as inspecting. You also uh, need to address a second foundation, like a, a detached garage or like additions. So when you find a, an add-on to the main foundation, for example, for a, I don't know, covered patio or an extra bedroom or a front porch or whatever the case may be, you need to address that as a separate foundation. And you need to provide uh, an opinion and some information on that almost separately from the main foundation in the foundation section but separately and finally an, an, an opinion as i said before does not mean call an engineer on every inspection that would be shirking the responsibility and it is not within your verbiage to ever say this foundation has failed you should say things like more movement than would uh, I would expect to see or that uh, I uh, deem as normal or beyond normal, whatever the case may be. Failed is one of those engineering terms. And they're the guys that, that are um, certified to say that, make that kind of an opinion. Okay. You also in that section need to report on what type of uh, foundation that uh, we've got. Slab and grade. Uh, I also highlight that it's a post tension if I find that that's the case, although I do know that most of them are hybrids. Uh, conventional. I, I have never seen a concrete slab that has no uh, uh, post tension holes in it that I could say was a conventional. I don't know what's in there just a slab of concrete as far as I know. Pier and beams, obviously, post foundations, uh, pontoons for pontoon house, house boats, <laughs> sometimes just dirt, just a dirt floor. Just uh, have you ever seen a detached wash that uh, didn't come with the house originally or the old house that they just put the, the um, 
the framing on the dirt. I leveled it out a little bit and used some uh, tar soaked uh, X, probably telephone hose or something, saw it down, uh, creosoted, and then got those funny. Sorry, that was just me being funny. Uh, okay, everybody. Generally, you want to report underground drains and their, and their functionality. So you do that by running water in them. And the reason that I put that on there was a house down in, uh, in uh, Westview, uh, about an 80 year old house that, uh, I don't know, maybe 50s, 1950s. And it had cast iron plumbing in it and uh, plumbing drain lines. And, we're running water until the while well, I'm in the room, run water for quite a while to, to make sure that uh, I don't have any clogs and stuff like that. And the one in the kitchen was right on the exterior wall. And as we're leaving, I shut off the water, and the client and I are walking down the side of the house. And underneath the foundation, it, the water is literally gushing out. Gushing out. It was unbelievable running down the driveway. And then uh, it was uh, just a matter of cast iron drains not being there anymore. And it was just something we couldn't see from the inside. You're also gonna want uh, water leak to report water leakage at hose pipes, at uh, showers. So you're gonna need to run those and plug them up where you can. It's kind of hard to tell on sunken showers, but plug them anyway. Uh, and even the ones that have vinyl uh, bases or marble bases, you know, let those run for a while too and check the exterior of those. Cause sometimes, especially on an outside wall, they were running down the outside of the, uh, the foundation wall. Uh, ir uh, irrigation system, underground leakage. Can't always tell, but as you run them and you're walking around checking the zones, you come upon a, a previously dry area that's now saturated, underground leak, and that'll cause foundation movement as well. You want to comment on the different difference in slopes of, of grading on perspective sides of the home. So if you're on the north end of Houston, many times you'll get into uh, the hilly topography areas. And uh, the uh, house on the right is higher than your house that you're inspecting and the house on the left is lower. And to the degree that they may even have uh, retention walls in between them, which is really a dramatic slope in the grading. And that affects your foundation in two ways. One is the, uh, the foundation should have a 45 degree angle coming off of it that uh, helps to support the foundation, the, the loading onto the soils. And the other is soil movement out from underneath the foundation. So notice what your, uh, what your uh, retention walls are, are doing. Are they pushing away from the foundation or not? And either way, we should have that same slope away uh, grading from the foundation that you're inspecting so as to not have negative drainage back toward the foundation where water is held. Uh, take a look for a peering or a partial peering. Difference in between the two of those would be, uh, you can't tell either one. In fact, you can see peering holes where the where the concrete has been broken out, it's really concrete patch holes, but you can't tell if there's a pier underneath there. So never say that this home has been peered because you don't know. And you don't know whether it's pier, full pier or partial peering. And that sometimes dramatically affects the future performance of a foundation. So if you think commonsensically about <clears throat> a seller trying to sell a house and the mean old inspectors come and said, hey, we got a lot of movement going on here. So the peering company is, is called, or the leveling company, and they, they submit a bid that says half of this house ought to be peered. Uh, but we can probably get away with just the, the garage that's poking out front of the house. And the uh, seller goes, okay, let me think. The difference between 10 grand and 20 grand, okay, I'll go 20. No, 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 I'm going 10. And so that's all that gets peered. So the original recommendation was not, was not adhered to. So that means that the, the other parts that probably needed peering 
maybe you're susceptible to movements. It also means, as we said before, that leveling companies don't really address the causes of the movement. And so they're still there. And 10 years, 18 years later, they can still cause the same, that tree right up against the foundation can still cause more foundation movement. It may not be sinking, the tree may be causing the peered area to go upward. Um, so the items that I put on my report that they need to be asking for, because it seems that they're never offered or even addressed on the uh, seller's disclosure, or very seldom, is engineers' reports from the peering, both initial and um, final. Yes, it's it's done. It's completed. The as builts with a engineer's stamp on it saying exactly what they're where they put the piers and this is different from the proposed diagram looks very similar but it's different uh, we also uh want to know about the warranty and is it transferable or is it even is there even one and we should know who the parent company is to see if they're even in business uh, finally we want a hydrostatic test and this is why I asked for that. I did a home in Kingwood about 10 years ago for a, a really nice couple. And they had foundation problems and they were fixed. And 10 years later, I'm back in the house and I, I walk into the bathroom and he's cleaning up. And I recognize him and I said, how are you doing? And, you know, we, he said, you know, Mike, we got the peering done and it was good. But we did not follow your recommendation on hydrostatic tests. And when they peered his home, which required full peering, uh, they broke, uh, when they lifted the foundation into level, they broke a bunch of the drain lines. And over eight years, everything that was going in his drain, into his drains was emptying underneath his foundation. And it was literally a quagmire. And at this point, when I was, came the second time, his house was sinking into the um, uh, north, section of Kingwood little subdivision there it was uh, it was pretty bad and he was he was just blown away anyway that's the reason for hydrostatic test after the, the peering that should be something that you're going to want to encourage your people to get if it's not done or look for a report on after the peering was done however many years ago that might be you're also gonna want hydrostatic tests on cast iron drains. And unfortunately, uh, TAR was instrumental in getting a, uh, a form uh, required by TREC that the seller has to uh, note that there may be um, uh, damage caused by the pressure of hydrostatic tests. Now, those of you who know what a hydrostatic test is, know that the only pressure on it is your ambient air pressure, okay, your atmospheric pressure at, uh, at the surface of the earth. Because they plug up the drain line as it's coming out of the foundation, they pull a toilet, with a garden hose they fill up the drain lines and they wait for two hours or an hour to see if the level goes down. There is no pressure. So don't be afraid to, or to advise your clients to get one of these, they're a big deal. And if you've got a home that's built in the 50s or 60s, that's got cast iron drains, um, I can nearly assure you that much of the cast iron has now rusted away, particularly underneath the foundation, and uh, it is the cause for foundation movement. Okay, if you see a primary condensation line going to the exterior of the house and it's leaking, and it's the primary again. I advise that these be attached to or, or tied into the uh, drain line up in the attic. They will cause foundation movement because a uh, cranking air conditioner may, in our humid climate, produce 15 to 20 gallons of, of uh, condensation line water every day. And it literally swells like negative drainage right there where it's being dumped that will cause foundation movements. Secondary 
condensation line leakage obviously is oh my gosh we got we got a drain van out there that's or we've got a primary that's clogged up. Nonetheless, you see them a lot that have been going on for a long time, and they will cause foundation uh, movement as well. Uh, okay, add-on foundations. You cannot tell if the primary foundation or the original foundation and the add-on are tied together. Most engineers these days, not all of them, but most of them, will tie the two together from a rebar standpoint. They were drill in and, and have rebar that crosses in between them. And that uh, literally uh, uh, ties the two together so they don't act as badly as two separate foundations which can move independently. But what I just said, that phrase that I just said, independently, move independently, I put on every report or have an add-on foundation, every single one of them because you just frankly don't know, and they can. And we'll see some pictures in a little bit where they have. And that, uh, that is part of your re reporting. It may not be a deficiency. If they're moving real bad though, it might be. Hey Mike, we have about 10 minutes and we do have some questions whenever you're ready. Okay, all right. Let me scamper through uh, the rest of the reporting, and then we're going to go very quickly through a bunch of pictures. I uh, can't really tell what, what slide I'm on. Four sloping and around level should be reported to our window of operation, brick drywall stuck up cracking, uh, trim cracking floor gaps in four boards, uh, brick slash window gaps at, at where the windows poke through the brick, expansion joint caulking, cracking. Exposed tendon ends should be reported. Live antenna grout missing should be reported. Soil foundation gaps. In other words, where the soil has dried up and pulled away from the foundation. One of my favorite pictures that works really good on a report. Soils and general and drainage issues. High and negative drainage against or near the foundation. Uh, tree and large bush proximity to the foundation. Blowouts, as we talked about. Uh, partial or full gutters, downspouts at the foundation. They should have a splash block. Retention walls we talked about. Crack tiles inside the house. Gap four boards. Draw footprint. And okay, one of the things I used to aid me is to draw a footprint, a footprint of the foundation, and put on there where I'm seeing the issues. It can often let me know uh, where the where the movement is taking place just because of the indicators that I find that we just mentioned, that we just went through. Okay, there's a separate foundation. Tell me when I get to five, Miranda, please. Uh, there's a maybe a pyramid. There's two separate foundations. Great picture, always include a picture of the separate foundations. There's your uh, forever uh, legacy diagonal crack above a door opening. I think we might have some foundation issues there. Top tracks in the bathroom, not always because of backer boards there, but when they are, it means it, it'll tell you something about the uh, intensity of the movement. Sewer cleanup leaking, subsiding soils into it, bearing soils from the foundation are affected by this. There's the brick window gaps we talked about. This is a 35 hole, foot hole in an intersection around the corner for me where uh, a leaking storm sewer that literally drug in that much dirt and the, and the uh, street just collapsed. 35 feet over probably 30 years, but I'll tell you the power of, of water and leaking drain lines. Uh, that's an expansion joint gap and it was gapped at the top so that they know the high point in the foundation uh, is right underneath it. If, it, if the, the crack narrows to a hairline as we go down. Crack and tile, window gaps again. There's a window that kind of popped out of the hole. It was the foundation blew up so bad. Another tile gap. Whoops, let me go back to that one. That was a pretty cool one. If you look right here and look very closely, you'll see that the, the uh, brick sags. 
This was actually a foundation where it was uh, it was following the brick was following the foundation. And if we look very close, there's a bunch of cracks on this. If you know anything about <clears throat> about bricklayer, <clears throat> bricklayers follow the the oldest and most simple guideline of a string line from here to here. There is almost no way that a bricklayer would have laid them like this unless this started out to be a fun house at a fair. There's the window sheetrock gaps, sheetrock gaps on the inside. This is in Spring Branch, and Spring Branch, Texas is known for Fault City. And that was the fault going from the high over here all the way down right over here. You can see the slope. And this house followed the, the fault. It was sitting right on the dead gum fault. Brick window gaps where this brick is moving outward fairly substantial on the movement. This I pulled up in front of it. This is what that tree is doing to the curve on the street. May mean we have some issues right up in here as this, this uh, house was pretty close. <clears throat> There's a mud seal anchor that's exposed on the side of a foundation. That I certainly would call because this part of the uh, framing is not attached to the foundation anymore. Top trap, see what we got going with the water on, see the water leakage that we've got going in there. Absolutely on my report. I also put on the report whether I can see the uh, the foundation floor in the garage. Well, it was always my favorite place to look. And this, this uh, day of, of uh, you know, staging the interior of houses, they go, well, just stick it all on the extraneous junk out in the garage. And so, I also put on whether I can get to the breaker box and the water heater and the um, um, sometimes the uh, uh, sprinkler controls, that sort of thing. The sewer clean, I mean, the, the water cutoffs. It's like, I hate staging. All right, we have good, about five minutes. Okay, there's an example of one side of the crack higher than the other side of the crack. No way. Okay. Um, spraying through. This would be a bad sign. Everything you're going to see on these, oops, how'd that one get in there? Everything you're going to see on these or something that uh, you would uh, want to report. Okay, Miranda, get me. Okay, give me one second. Let me just get this poll out of the screen. Stop sharing. Okay. Let's see. So we have a question, are detached garages required to be inspected? Yes. Yes, okay. The next one I see there, what is the main overhang? The max overhang for brick is one third offset. One third of the width of the brick offset the foundation. John. And then, okay, we're not gonna be able to get to all of these. Would you please go over the taping requirement regarding the maximum allowed exposed tendon steel? Tendon steel, okay. On the live end, it's right up against, excuse me, on the dead end, it's right up against on the, uh, the, uh, on the live end, it can be as much as four inches, less if possible to four inches. Okay, let's see. Can you define what a blowout is? Sure. <clears throat> the cables are, are stressed to the 29,000 kips that we talked about. When for some reason the, the tension is released by faulty placed uh, uh, wedges or, a, or a, uh, an anchor that comes loose and breaks free, that the power of that uh, causes the uh, cable to retract and blows out the top of the foundation, sometimes the bottom of the foundation. That's what a blowout is. And if you've ever been in a foundation, I mean, in a, in a, um, a subdivision where they're, they're tensioning and they have a, a, a blowout, it sounds like a bomb going off. Okay. Um, you don't want to be in the way. Let's see. Okay, um, this question is kind of long. So I'm going, I'm going to post this in the comments, Mike, so that it's easier for you to see. Okay. Uh, 
I've had my chat out of the way. Let me move it in the way. Okay. On a PMB foundation, the peers are performing solid concrete blocks, and windows off grid, have multiple cracks and drywall, and the floors are on level. Will you render an opinion as to, and the floors are on level? Will you render opinions for me? Just on what you've, you've given me, I can't tell who it is that submitted this, but I would say that they need to have a, 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 a structural engineer come and take a look at it. Sounds like it's in need of leveling to me. Okay. And then there's another one about erosion that I just posted as well. Okay. Let me scroll down here. Oh my gosh, that's a long one. Oh, up in there. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> Brick is four inches. Anything else is six inches uh, as far as your exposure. And you want the positive drainage away from the foundation on all four elevations everywhere. Let me make sure I answered it. There often be one or two corners of a house exposed by erosion. Yeah, yeah, you got to have it all the way around. One of the, one of the, um, one of the things about any foundation is what you do to part of it you want to do all the way around. That's why sprinkling all the way around is important. Gutters all the way around is important. The grading and drainage positive all the way around is important. Perfect. And then we'll do one more question. Someone asked, what are your thoughts on gutters? I see gutters on the front, but not the back. This would appear to cause significant moisture difference around foundation. I would recommend them. I would ask them to consider them. And I would give them a reason why. And we just it's what I just said. Perfect. Is there anything else that you wanted to quickly mention to the class before we end the session? Uh, let me look and see. I think we talked about uh, just in order to do this competently, you need to have not only the uh, knowledge, but the certification and the experience. So don't think this is just an ancillary source of income that you can jump right into. Remember that your numero uno is your client.